under the big skies of Canada's prairies is a surprisingly wild place. But it's a landscape that's been changed a lot. We've completely lost our memory of what grassland was because we got, got rid of so much of it. Still, there are people working to keep it wild. I don't want to see any species die out. If that means that we have to adjust the way that we do things, then that's our job. I'm surrounded by a vast expanse of prairie and sky, and it may not seem like there's much to look at. Good for cattle and wheat fields, nothing special. But if you wait patiently and look carefully, you can see how filled with wildlife the grasslands can be. Three-beard sparrow, meadowlark, a savanna sparrow, two clay-colored sparrows, rakes pipit behind us, horned lark here, and then three chestnut co longspurs chasing each other. Trevor Harriet is an expert on grassland songbirds. In early spring, you know, I'm feeling pretty optimistic and I want to I wanna get out there and hear those familiar voices again because winter on the prairie is long and you want to hear some music, right? So you go out there listening for the first metal larks and the horned larks who are here even earlier. When you hear one, it definitely lifts your, lifts your spirit because, ah, they're back again. Let's add one more bird sparrow and a pipit and a marbled godwit. Trevor and his birding partner, Ed Roger, are in southern Saskatchewan on one of the largest pieces of wild prairie left. I've always loved getting out to the big pieces of grassland because out here you, know, you can half imagine what the prairie world was like 125, 130 years ago. They're up at sunrise each morning, looking and listening to monitor the population numbers of these grassland birds. Mostly crickets. <laughs> For years, Trevor and others have been noticing an alarming drop in the number of songbirds returning to nest here. I hate to be a downer about this because this sounds so beautiful even now, but I know it sounded more intense. It was just this amazing orchestra, this assembly of sound, and that's just diminished greatly. Grassland songbirds are the fastest declining group of birds in all of North America. There are no trees here, so these birds must nest on the ground making their chicks especially vulnerable to predators and floods. They often lose their first nest. And when they try again, they can move two to three kilometers away to find a better site. That's a problem if the patch of wild grassland they're on isn't big enough. This is one of the largest chunks left. In other areas, the prairie looks much different. When Europeans arrived, they recognized the potential in the rich soils of this land, some of the richest on the planet, and began to convert the grassland into agricultural crops. Most Canadians wouldn't realize that in Saskatchewan we have less than 20% of our grassland remaining, and that that, that figure is far worse than the loss of habitat in the Amazon basin, you know. 
we completely lost our memory of what grassland was because we got rid of so much of it. We've changed it so much, we don't value it as a wild place anymore. We're living in a time where there are huge ecological, environmental issues. In the middle of all those alarms going off, it's hard for something like native grassland to get hurt. Least protected, most endangered. It's not a good combination. The grasslands' ancient inhabitants have had to adapt to this rapidly changing landscape. Pronghorn antelope have lived here since the time when cheetahs and lions roamed these plains, when they evolved a special ability to escape these predators. Speed. They are capable of speeds up to 100 kilometers per hour. Pronghorn antelope are built to run. They have a large windpipe, heart, and lungs to gulp huge amounts of air. And their light bones and long cushioned hooves help absorb the shock of their high speeds. But the modern prairie landscape has thrown up a new challenge. Cattle fences. For thousands of years, pronghorn never encountered barriers like this. And because they're built for speed, it makes them poor jumpers. A deer can make it look so easy but there are real risks to pronghorn trying this. It is a pretty significant problem in this area of the world where there are so many fences, and it makes it quite difficult for a species like the pronghorn. Mike Verhage of the Alberta Conservation Association is out with a team of volunteers trying to make life easier for the pronghorn. Pronghorn typically cross a fence underneath rather than over top. And uh, when they cross underneath, it causes them to get scraped up on their backs so that all of the hair gets scraped off their back and uh, their skin is exposed, they get scarring, and that's where the disease and the infections come in. With only a few places along a fence line where they can easily go under, they must bunch up and go single file. For predators like coyotes or golden eagles, this may be the only time they can catch up with them. What we're doing out here is a wildlife-friendly fencing project. We're taking off the bottom strand and putting up smooth wire at 18 inches. At the end of the day, it feels really fantastic. Get something done that's beneficial for the animals moving through this area. Projects like this are proof that with a little effort, humans can make room for wildlife on the grasslands. Animals are often seen as a nuisance, a threat, or a resource for our own use. Some species have borne the brunt of human impact more than others. The North American Plains buffalo, or bison, is one of them. Weighing over a ton, 
The males are the largest land animal on the continent. Before European settlement, there were as many as 60 million bison on the continent. Today, only 20,000 still live on wild grassland, but all behind fences. There are no longer any free-roaming bison on the North American grassland. Oh, look at it. The removal of bison, a keystone species, changed the prairies forever. Uh, it's starting to, just takes a couple seconds to pick it up. The prairies have evolved over thousands of years with bison. So you kind of want to reintroduce it and keep things as natural as possible in these native areas that are left. Dale Gross and Hannah Hilger Plant ecologists from the University of Saskatchewan are studying the effects of bison grazing on land protected by the Nature Conservancy of Canada. You know, there's multiple different ways to approach a problem in the landscape. One of the better ways is to understand how nature works, how the landscape works, and bison are part of that landscape here. Yeah, we're picking up some now. Oh, good. Yeah. Dale and Hannah collect detailed data on how the bison move around and graze the grassland. The bison herds that once roamed the prairies were so large that they could never stay in one area for long. So the plants of the prairies adapted to periods of intense grazing. Bison typically only eat grass, so it allows a diversity of plants to flourish on the prairies around them. Their heavy, sharp hooves help to aerate the soil and slice up the vegetation, allowing it to decompose and regenerate faster. You know, they're creating habitat uh, constantly by their grazing patterns and wallowing patterns, so it doesn't take you long to understand why they're the keystone species of the North American prairies. Rolling in the dirt, or wallowing, serves many functions, from displaying dominance to shedding their winter fur. Oh, here we go. Oh, neat. But it's also one of the subtle ways you know, that bison transform the grassland. Uh, some initial recolonization with plants. Looks like rose in the middle there. Good for scratching. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is this another. Is older one. Yeah, this is just another oh, stage. Or is of... it older? There's actual. Oh, actual hair. Eyes and hair in this one. Very soft. It would be good insulator, yeah. yeah. If I was a bird, I'd build my nest out of this stuff. They had better reproductive success because they built their nest out of bison mm -hmm. hair because it's more insulated. Mm hmm. Nice and cozy. And you'd have to think these depressions after snow melt in the spring would hold yeah. water for a yeah. little bit longer. So that's creating little micro habitats. Dale and Hannah's work on the grasslands is part of a larger conservation movement to understand what has been lost and what can be gained by bringing it back. Native prairie like this is just such a special place. It's nice to kind of keep the historic processes going and try to maintain the habitat for all the species that live here for years to come. One of the species that has been most impacted by changes to the Great Plains has been the sage grouse. Each spring, these males gather on a traditional breeding site known as a lek to strut their stuff. Only males have these chest sacs, which create their otherworldly mating call. 
a sound that can travel up to three kilometers in hopes of wooing a mate. But ultimately, it's lady's choice. There seems to be only one female on the lek today, so the males are desperate to attract her attention. This morning, it would appear that nothing is catching her eye. While it seems there are lots of birds here, the reality is that in some areas their numbers have dropped by 90%. The sagebrush prairie is disappearing. For millennia, bison grazing sustains sage grouse habitat. But now, help is coming from another animal. Cattle are just really, really slow buffalo. I mean, they're not the same, but they eat relatively the same things. Miles Anderson is a fourth generation cattle rancher operating on over 16,000 hectares of mixed grass prairie in southern Saskatchewan. He's a key player in protecting and recovering wild sage grouse habitat in Canada. We're not managing this land to run the maximum amount of beef per acre. We're just trying to create the best habitat for the things that we can manage. For example, the sage grouse. This is the main thing about grazing, though. Cows eat the tops of these plants, huh? Then you see how the it spreads out instead of up. And then it gives the sage grouse there's more places to nest. And on the outside, there's all the, the forbs and whatever the chick needs to live on is there still. Typical range management is to graze everything evenly, right? And yet some things like it grazed off to flourish or to do good, some things like it tall. So what we try and do is to create these patches of various states of grazing all within a very small area so that everybody kind of has a home. I mean, you probably could do the same thing with a bunch of people running around with lawnmowers. But I mean, that'd be pretty expensive and stupid, but I mean, we're just finally figuring this stuff out after so many years here that these animals can do things for us if we want to use them. Miles' success prompted his neighbor, Grasslands National Park, to ask for his help. Fences kept his cattle out but with bison gone, the park's grassland was suffering. Miles is now allowed to graze his cows inside the park boundaries to revive the wild prairie. This cattle operation is a model for the future of conservation on the modern day prairie. While cattle are a relative newcomer on the grassland, one of its former wild inhabitants is making a surprise comeback. Just across the Alberta border, in the high plains of northern Montana, spring comes late. The melting snow is a signal to stir for one of the prairie's residents. A female grizzly bear emerges from her winter den. In recent years, 
grizzlies have begun to move back onto the grasslands from their mountain strongholds. Denning this far out on the prairies is rare, so local biologists are tracking her with a GPS collar. It must be nice to stretch after spending six months inside a den. And last winter was more cramped for her than usual. probably been 150 years since a grizzly bear has given birth this far out on the grasslands. For grizzlies, this is returning home. During the European settlement of the Great Plains, they were either killed or driven off into the Rocky Mountains. This mother is a pioneer, and she is going to have to walk a careful line to raise her cubs in the modern prairie. And it's not just grizzly bears that are returning to their ancestral grassland homes. A mother swift fox is waiting for her mate to return with food for her four rambunctious pups. In Canada, swift foxes were poisoned and trapped to extinction in the early 20th century. Decades of captive breeding and a reintroduction program have allowed this diminutive predator to make a comeback. But to fully recover their numbers, they need large tracts of wild grassland, which are rare these days. Tired of waiting for her mate, the mother fox heads out to hunt on her own. Learning to hunt is a big part of a young fox's life, so the kits like to practice their pouncing techniques. Insects, mice, and birds make up most of their diet. Adult swift foxes are small, the size of a large house cat, so a ground squirrel is big game. These pups are fat and well-fed, but the species' long-term future 
depends on our ability to protect these remaining tracts of wild prairie. Stretching from Manitoba to East Texas, there was a lush landscape known as the tall grass prairie. It was the most fertile of all native grasslands. It's such rich soil that 95% of it has been converted to farmland and the tiny bits that are left are fragmented and scattered, making life hard for the last survivors of this native prairie. Like the endangered western prairie fringed orchid that have a spectacular blooming each summer. The blooms only last a few days, so the plants have a tiny window to reproduce. Plus, they only have a single pollinator who comes at night. Hawk moths. These moths have a tongue long enough to reach the nectar deep inside the flower. While they are feeding, the moth's eyes brush against the orchid's pollen. It's only hawk moths that can transfer pollen between individual orchids, allowing the plants to reproduce. The extreme fragmentation of the tall grass prairie makes it hard for hawk moths to find these beautiful orchids during their short blooming window. It's been four months since the mother grizzly left her prairie den with her three tiny cubs. Now, she is down to two. One of her cubs was hit by a vehicle and killed as the family was crossing a highway. With her remaining two cubs, she has been making a good living out on the modern prairie. For young cubs, the human world can provide fun stuff to play with. The grizzly's fearsome reputation has limited their ability to repopulate the grasslands. People have always felt that bears and livestock don't mix.
And while some grizzlies have killed farm animals, most bears are after much simpler fare. Berries. Moving out onto the prairies can be good for bears. This is a productive landscape. There's a greater diversity and abundance of plants here than in the mountains. This mother bear is making a better life out here for her cubs. She's raising a new generation of prairie bears that will only know the Great Plains as home. Animals living on the grasslands today evolved on a landscape with a wide diversity of plants. For some, these plants provide a place to hide. For others, a bite to eat. The rich variety of plants has disappeared as humans have altered the grassland landscape. But Dale Gross and Hannah Hilger are trying to bring back one of the key ecological processes that shape this diverse plant life. Getting ready to burn. Yeah, I guess nervous excitement. Hopefully the weather stays not windy. Yeah. <laughs> We're introducing small little patches of fires because we understand that that's how things evolved here on the prairies over thousands of years. Indigenous people across North America use fire for a variety of reasons. So we're just trying to bring a little bit of that back and to see if that's gonna have a beneficial impact on the wildlife and species risk in this area. One team right on the fire line starting the fire and kind of following behind and putting out any hot spots that are a threat to escape. Last line of defense. And we have a crew wetting down with water just to have another backup for making sure the fire doesn't escape. Fire helps control invasive plants, while the ash left behind nourishes the grassland. With the grass cleared, insects living in the top layer of soil are available for those that want them. One really cool thing we saw immediately after the burn was we saw the birds responding to the fire. So they were out there right away, picking at the ash layer, trying to find bugs. Prairie plants are like icebergs. So large amounts of these plants are below ground, protected from fire. This allows the grass to quickly regrow after the fire passes. I was surprised to see at how fast it turned green after the fire especially compared to the surrounding area. I did expect that to happen, but I didn't expect it to be so prominent. We've been out here for a few weeks, and it has been really interesting to see it progress and uh, recover since the fire. One, two, three. Fire also burns in patches, encouraging plant diversity. Cholaria macrantha. And Budalua gracilis. There should be some areas burned with more intensity, others burn with less. And in general, you, you create a variety of habitats across the landscape that wouldn't have been there before. And so with those variety of habitats, you should see more species able to find a home. Mm -hmm. You can see an animal has taken advantage of yeah. this area of sparse vegetation. Yeah. It has his little burrow here, he likes that spot without yeah. grass so he can peek out of his home and see if there's any predators. Yeah. Give us a couple of 
wax. Dale and Hannah hope that their experiments may prove the importance of bringing back fire as a tool to rejuvenate native grassland. Species at risk have so little habitat left. By maintaining the natural processes on the system, you will ensure that they have their habitat for years to come. The loss of fire on the North American grasslands has affected more than just the habitat. For people of the Blackfoot Nation, the loss has also affected their culture. So when I was young and very curious, and I asked my mom, uh, why do they call us Blackfoot people? She said, because we would make fire on the prairie and we would go in after the fire to, to check the landscape. And so our moccasins would be uh, blackened. My name is uh, Holy Walking Woman, uh, Paulette Fox. I come from the Blood Tribe. Near the Milk River Canyon in southern Alberta, a wildfire burned last summer, and the rejuvenation of the native grasses is easy to see from above. Wow, look at that rock. It just got charred. Okay. Paulette Fox is a cultural leader and an expert on native plants. She's here to show her daughters the effect of fire on their traditional lands. Today, we walk through the burned areas to check and look for medicines and, and uh, see some of the things that it had exposed. I feel happy, da might be for all the animals in the area of the regeneration and the new growth that, you know, they're happy and, and they're going to reap the benefits. Sing them a song. <laughs> It was really important for me that my children get to see this place that is in the genetic memory of our people. The fire has revealed teepee rings, circles of rocks that held down traditional tents used by Indigenous peoples for millennia. My prayer is that my children come here in the future and, and bring their children and other young people and are able to, to go through the healing that we need to as Indigenous people. The resiliency of our culture depends on the resiliency of our younger generation and the resiliency of the landscape. We're all interconnected, you can't separate us. The future of wildlife on the prairie depends on people willing to share space with their wild neighbors. But what does that mean when one of your neighbors is a grizzly bear? Through the summer, the grizzly mother has been teaching her cubs how to navigate the challenges of their modern grassland home. As grizzlies reclaim their prairie territory, they come into contact with people more often than ever before. I moved here in 2003, and it was probably a year or two before we ever saw a bear after I moved here. And my husband grew up here, and he said it was unheard of to see a grizzly on Birch Creek. Trina Bradley's family cattle ranch is on the front lines of bear-human relations on the grasslands today. Do we have a halter for whiskey? Just as the grizzly cubs need to learn how to live on their new grassland home, Trina is teaching her daughter Cadence how to get along with grizzly bears 
in their backyard. It's a different world for kids that live up here where there's bears. A couple years ago, we had a, a calf that was orphaned. And so we just had it in here by itself because we had nothing else to put in with it. And um, a bear did come in and kill it. And Cadence was actually the first one into the corral. And you know, had the bear still been here? I mean, that's pretty serious. She was only probably six then. So she was just a tiny little girl. Ma, do you like how I did her hair? Yeah. A lot of people assume that we hate bears and that's not the case. We need to conserve this land because at some point I wanna hand it down to my daughter. So I need to take care of it. And in taking care of it, we're also taking care of everything that lives here, not just our cows and horses. And I enjoy having wildlife and I think it's important and I don't wanna see any species die out. And so if that means that we have to adjust the way that we do things a little bit in order to accommodate them, then I feel like that's our job. There are simple but effective ways people like Trina have adapted to having grizzlies in their backyard. Most of the bears around here know what electric fences are because there's fences around like all the beehives and chicken coops and so they immediately are like, oh yeah, better not touch that, it's hot. Trina and her family also regularly deploy remote cameras to track local bears' movements close to their house. Okay, so I think if we go about here, we should be able to get any action right there. That's good, okay, hold this. Hold this so I can tie it up. Growing up on a ranch is the best. She's got all these experiences that town kids don't get to have, and it's absolutely worth living with bears. Look at, look at his claws, holy cow. Those are cute. Yeah, those are really long. I feel safer living out here with bears than I would in the city. Mm -hmm. And there's plenty of food on this creek for them to eat besides livestock. They're fat and happy here without ever having to even look at our cows. So really, aside from the few problem bears, the rest of our bears are more than welcome to be here. This mother and her cubs will soon settle in for winter hibernation. But their future on the grasslands is uncertain. It depends on people willing to share this amazing landscape with wildlife. This small family of bears may represent the start of a new era of recovery for this wild and wonderful place.